Yeah. Uh, how about this this guy right here? Well, it was seven years from the time we started the project, but a lot of that time was just working on the computer and what they call finite element analysis. That's figuring out, like you, you in a computer, you can create a model, right? And you can turn it and look at it any way you want. But another thing you can do in the computer that's really interesting is you can subject it to forces and see what happens. And you haven't built a darn thing yet, but you're watching what happens when you squeeze the heck out of it and where those stress fields build up. And we, we broke and imploded a whole bunch of these things virtually before we got the, the ideas that were going to work the best. So that's, that's kind of like you've heard that old expression, measure twice and cut once, right? Okay, well, we measured a thousand times before we cut anything. Uh, so that was the first few years. And that was just Ron and a couple other engineers working. We didn't have the full team yet. Uh, I'm kind of giving a, a long roundabout answer. Short answer is seven years. But it really took about two years to, to physically Build the build the sub, and most of that that activity was in about the last six or eight months before we actually went out. But another way to answer the question is this: When I walked into the shop in Sydney after having worked on this thing for over six years, I walked in and there was an empty shop floor. There was nothing there. This is where the sub was supposed to be. There was nothing there. It was just a bare, empty floor. That was two months before I got in it and made the first dive. So the whole sub came together like a big model kit and got bolted together, plugged in, all the electronics plugged together, integrated, tested in two months. So I could say two months. <laughs> Somebody else have a question? This young lady right here? It can go as deep as any place on this planet. What about that, huh? Yeah, and that was, the, that was the whole idea. And we actually think we went to the very, very deepest spot. Kind of, if you imagine Mount Everest is the highest spot, flip it upside down. We went to the deepest spot. And that's, and the purpose of that, and the, same, and the reason why I ran across Nereus's tracks, they did the same thing, is once you've proven to yourself and to the rest of the science community that you can go to the deepest place in the ocean, now what can you do? You can go anywhere in the ocean, literally anywhere in the ocean. Now, it doesn't make sense to dive the deep sea challenger to say the depth of Titanic. You could, but it's really designed to go deeper to these deep trenches. Now the deep trenches, um, if you added them all up, they're all over the world. If you add them all up, it's a total area equal to North America. And nobody has been down there other than, you know, uh, the, the, the operators of Nereus looking through its cameras, myself, but in terms of human eyes looking out of viewport, just me in one little spot and two guys back in 1960 named Don Walsh and Jacques Picard who went in a big na uh, uh, bathyscaphe as part of a Navy project. They went down and took a look for about 20 minutes. Other than that, nobody's looked with human eyes at a territory on this planet the size of North America. How crazy is that? You guys probably think pretty much the whole world's been explored, right? You know, we've been to the North Pole, been to the South Pole, been to the Congo, been to the Amazon. What's left, right? Well, how about a place the size of North America? That's pretty amazing. And, the, and I didn't know what I was going to find down there, but I knew one thing for certain, that whatever I brought back, any sample that I brought back, would have new species in it. And guess what? 68 new species uh, just from the one expedition. S some of that in the Challenger Deep, and some of it in another trench we dove in called the New Britain Trench which is uh, right near Papua New Guinea. So, you know, next time you're around a globe or a map of the, of the Pacific, see where Papua New Guinea is, and that's where we, we dove. And that was a trench. No, we couldn't even find any scientific data on the New Britain Trench. Nobody had ever written a single paper, published scientific paper, about the New Britain Trench. So I knew that just going down there and looking would be new science. So this is like, there's a whole frontier down there. Now. Dr. Avery was clear that that's not the only thing we're, that we're interested in in the ocean, you know, because the oceans are very important to the, to, they're like the life support system of the planet. And all of these big storms and stuff that are being driven by changes in, in the climate, the ocean is where the heat, you know, we talk about the, the greenhouse gas is heating up the atmosphere, but it's the oceans that hold the heat. And the oceans have to warm up for our, our whole planet to get warmer. And so understanding that whole, that whole heat cycle and the hydrological cycle and everything. That's, ha that's how we're going to understand climate change and superstorms and all that sort of thing. So understanding the ocean is 
super, super important right now, much more so than it's ever been in the past. And at the same time, you know, the, the government is, is funding ocean science less and less. So we're kind of going the wrong direction. We need to be going the other direction. And the important thing is, you know, people like you that are 12, 13 years old now, you know, you're going to make a huge difference when we really need... Everybody wave. <laughs> you're going to make a huge difference to this if you decide to go into careers in science, engineering, that sort of thing. Okay, maybe one more one more question. Yeah, this this guy right here. That's a really nobody ever asked that question before. <laughs> That's a good question. You know, I think it could. No. Uh, well, let's think about it for a second. The life support system would work in space. Yeah, John, you might have to bolt the hatch shut a little bit tighter. You know, the hatch can hold out a pressure of sixteen thousand pounds per square inch, which is a lot. That's like taking uh, three Humvees and stacking them up on your thumbnail. Now multiply that over the whole surface of the, of the vehicle, right? But the thing is that the hatch is held shut by that pressure from the outside. We just turn it hand tight when we bolt. When I get bolted inside, John over here, he, does the, the, he closes me in. He just turns it down hand tight on three bolts. So those might leak in space because the pressure would be going the other way. Because in space, the, the pressure would be less outside. So, I don't know. It's called stump the expert. <laughs> hey, one thing I should point out to everybody, I'm talking about this sphere that I get in, and you can't see it. You see this sphere right over here? This is an exact duplicate of the sphere that's inside the sub. And the sphere that's inside the sub, I'm going to walk over and show you where it is. Right here. Okay. So that's where I'm sitting. And when the sub goes in the water, it sits like this on the ship. But when it goes in the water, it rotates into a vertical position. And then it drops like a torpedo going straight down toward the bottom of the ocean. And the whole idea is to go really fast through the water, get down there so that I have lots of time to explore on the bottom. So I'm sitting inside that sphere right there. And if you guys get a chance, go look in it and see how cramped it is with all the electronics, camera controls, video screens, and all the other switches and knobs, and I know what most of them do. Um, <laughs> and uh, so actually, you guys would be a much better size. We could probably get two of you guys in there. <laughs> of course, no pilot, so you might have difficulty getting permission from your mom and dad. <laughs> OK, I think maybe, what, one more question? One more question. OK, this young lady right here. Well, the, the purpose of that sphere is to withstand the pressure of the water outside. So I actually don't feel any change in pressure. If I feel a change in pressure, something has gone very wrong <laughs> at that moment. And that would probably be the last thought going through my mind. Right? That's, that's why it's so important the way that sphere is designed. Otherwise, it could just <laughs> crush like a beer can, you know, if we didn't calculate it properly. Now, technically, this sphere has is, is got a much thinner wall than the one that's really in the sub. Because we, we, we didn't have to make it the full thickness, it would have been would have been too heavy. But other than that, it's identical in every way, including all the electronics inside actually work, and we can close the hatch, turn on the life support system, and live inside that sphere. So this was our training sphere, and we used to put this in a big freezer, and freeze it. Because the other thing that happens at at great depth is no sunlight gets down there, and and very little heat gets down there. So the temperature is only a degree or two above freezing for most of the descent and, and at the bottom. So what happens is that is the whole sub gets really cold right away. So I'm kind of scrunched in. My feet are touching one side of the metal sphere. My head's touching the other side. So my head starts to freeze and my feet start to freeze. And the middle part of me has got a lot of warm air pumping out of all the electronics. You know how like, an ele like electronics, when they're working, they usually have like a little fan like your computer. Heat comes out, right? So it's like I had a heater in the middle and it was cold on both ends. So pretty uncomfortable. That and you're basically scrunched in and can't move for 12 hours. But I'm not complaining. It's, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm having such a great time down there. You know, it's the most exciting thing I think that you can do is to go exploring around the deep ocean looking at things no human being's ever seen before. So I didn't even notice. Right up until the time I, I you know, threw the switch, dropped the weights, started heading back up. Then I really didn't have much to do, and I wasn't really exploring anymore. And then I noticed how much my butt hurt. 
how cold I was and all that stuff. And it still was an hour and a half to get back up. Okay, well, I think we've, we've uh, these were great questions, by the way. And so uh, thanks for listening and thanks for, for your excitement and your, your attention. Sure. Okay. I guess yeah. If there uh, if there's anybody f uh, from uh, the the adults from the press that wants to ask a question, uh huh? Um, what would you consider yourself, filmmaker or explorer? And if you could only pick one, which one would you pick? You know, don't make me have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have to decide. I, I want I want the cake and the ice cream. Uh, you know, here's here's the, the way I look at it is there's there's exploration, and there's filmmaking, and if you think of it as a Venn diagram, the overlap there is maybe documentary filmmaking, or, or in a broader sense, storytelling. And I was talking to all the explorers at, at National Geographic over the last couple of days. They were having their Explorers Symposium. And they have what they call emerging explorers. So us, you know, old gray explorers get to talk to the young explorers. And I said, guys, the most important thing about exploration is not just the doing of the deed itself, or the going, the looking, the, the investigating. It's telling the story. Because telling the story is how you bring the other seven billion people on the planet along with you to places. If you're out in the rainforest someplace, we don't want everybody tromping around out there. They'll, they'll mess the place up. You've got to come back and tell the story. If you're finding something in the ocean, we don't want everybody jumping in on scuba and, and you know busting up all the coral. You've got to tell the story. And the other thing is, if you want funding to go do it again, <laughs> you've got to tell the story. And you better make it good. <laughs> So that's where I live at that, at that boundary layer between these two, two fields of science and exploration on the one hand and, and fictional storytelling on the other. And uh, I think the skill set applies all, all, the, all the way across. Uh, somebody else? Yes. What's next for you? Well, next for me that's going to take most of my focus is doing Avatar 2 and Avatar 3. Which, yeah, okay, all right. I guess, I guess I better make those movies. <laughs> but in parallel, on a parallel track with that, obviously now I'm in the, I'm in the Hui family. I'll be in, involved in the Center for Marine Robotics. I'll be working with Susan to, to, find, to find funding, which will come from you know, private philanthropy, uh, corporate sponsorships, government you know, NSF grants and NOAA grants and things like that. So, you know, that'll be, that'll be my, my parallel track in the backfield. And if something comes along in terms of a new vehicle system that's exciting, you know, I'll want to I'll be involved in that as well. Yes? How nervous were you on your first dive? Well, I was just, I just said something to yesterday that, that actually kind of made sense. If I was worried about it, my time to be worried about it was a couple years earlier before I'd spent all the money. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I got there, you know, it was kind of, dumb to be nervous but of course you are a little bit I think I was probably more nervous the night before when I didn't have anything to focus on or in the days leading up to it when I was actually in the sub from the time the sub went in the water we were always already having problems the nice thing about problems is it takes your mind off being nervous because you've got things to solve uh, first thing that happened when the sub went in we, we launched it in marginal conditions with a sea state that was a little too high this is for the deepest dive I'd already made uh, six or seven previous dives at that point and going deeper and deeper down to five miles so I was pretty familiar with the sub and its systems and how it handled and all that first thing that happened on that dive was the sea state was so big that it blew open a, um, a hatch uh, let's see up right up here that contained a lift bag uh, what we called the soft ballast system that was part one of the safety systems of the sub and I had written very step-by-step -step protocol for every uh, every part of the operation just kind of like you'd have uh, you know, uh, if you were a NASA astronaut, you know, everything was all written down in case I fritzed out and, and missed, missed a step. Uh, and it said very clearly, recover the sub and repack the bag and restow the, restow the hatch and get it, get it back in the water. But I knew that if we took the time to do that, the little bit of a weather window that we were experiencing right there was going to go away. And the sea state was going to get even higher and I'd miss the dive. And maybe not even be able to complete it uh, during that expedition. So that was a non-starter. So I had to call David Watherspoon on the, on the surface radio and say, tell the divers to, to cut the system away. So the first thing that happened was I lost one of my safety systems. <laughs> so the point is that you're processing problems and you're doing things all the time. And there's the anticipation. It's so exciting. You know, I'm going to go down and see something nobody's ever seen. 
the two guys that dove in, the, in 1960, Don Walsh and Jacques Picard, in their famous dive, they dove actually, even though it was within Challenger Deep, it was 34 miles to the west of where I was diving because there are two deep spots in the Challenger Deep. So I was diving in the, in the eastern basin, and I knew I was going to see something no human being had ever seen before, and that's pretty cool. There were going to be new species. There were going to be things, not that I couldn't imagine them, but they were going to be definitely cool, whatever they were. Well, that's, that's a pretty valid question. How would we spend whatever resources we have? How would we spend those, those resources? Well, I think you know, we're more or less in agreement here that we need to get uh, uh, as close to a, to a real-time, continuous observation of the ocean going. That's sort of the equivalent of our, of our atmospheric monitoring. You know, we've got satellites in orbit, orbit and Doppler radar systems that allow us to take, take a snapshot of what's happening in the atmospheric system of the Earth. We don't have anything like that in the ocean. There's, there's, for every thousand atmospheric data points that we receive, uh, we get one from the ocean. So if we're going to be able to, to, to understand the scope of the problem of climate change, uh, and if we're going to be able to, uh, you know, really see how, how we're degrading the oceans, we've got to have a lot more monitoring out there. So I'd be building fleets, swarms of, of autonomous vehicles, gliders, I'd be developing new technology to have them be able to surface, communicate, go back down, possibly communicate with bottom deployed uh, instrument networks and so on. At the same time, for my own personal curiosity, I would, I would create more vehicles like this or, or probably autonomous versions of, of a vehicle like this with artificial intelligence to go explore that, that unknown continent down there. Because we've got to keep, us, keep ourselves alive. That's the highest priority. And understanding and monitoring the ocean is the, the way we're going to do that. And then the purpose of staying alive is to be curious and to go find out more. So we, we do that in parallel. I don't know. What do you think? Does that correspond more or less to, to oh, what we've been? Good. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Dang it. <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe one more question and then we'll. Okay. What do you think? Yeah. All right. And so I've answered every question. <laughs> this, this gentleman. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've made uh, uh, 88 submersible dives to depths, you know, two miles deeper or deeper. And you always see a lot of animal tracks on the bottom. Uh, sometimes you go to places where there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of biomass, like at the hydrothermal vents. Sometimes you go to places where it's just basically kind of a sediment bottom. That sediment bottom has always got a lot of animal activity. When I got down to the, the so-called ponded sediment that's in the center in the center of the, of the trench. Imagine the trench is kind of V-shaped, right? And the sediment kind of ponds in the center of it. And it's, it's as flat as this parking lot right here. I didn't see any animal tracks. Now, it, it's not because the animals weren't there. It's because it's so seismically active there that that whole place got a big shake, shook it all up, and then it settled back out like snow. Sometime in the, in the recent past, geologically recent past, it might have been, we know, we know it wasn't in the previous three years because the nearest track was there, but uh, sometime recently. So that's kind of interesting, you know. And uh, then you st start to think about what would it be like if you were down here when something like that happened? Because the, the big earthquakes that create the tsunamis, like the one that hit Indonesia, the one that hit Japan, those start in those deepest trenches. It's that subduction process where one plate is grinding under another all, you know, all day long, day in, day out. Every once in a while, it just gives and then a whole bunch of water starts moving all around the, the Pacific. You know, so understanding these, these deep trenches it has a, may have a direct impact on, on uh, human welfare in the future. In terms of the experience of it, kind of like what did it feel like, it was like landing on an, on an alien planet like Mars or, or the Moon. Very desolate, very austere. I had to drive for about a, a mile and a half before I got to any kind of a contour. And then it started to slope upward as I started to work my way up the north, north slope of the trench. Uh, but just a very, very lunar landscape. Now, if you were observant, you know, I, I was looking for, for bits of life here and there. And, and there were these things called xenophyophores just sitting on the bottom. They're about this big, single cell. Single cell animal, this big. Really amazing. And uh, lots of little amphipods swimming around, but you had to look for them. And some other things that we're still not 100% sure 
what they were. Scientists are still still working on the, the data that was br brought back. Unfortunately, I had a technical failure of my hydraulic system. At Walt, you can close your ears at this point in time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was unable to close the sample door. So a lot of my sediment sample washed out. But we were able to retain just enough to identify over 60 new species of bacteria. Now, interestingly enough, in that little tiny sample were over 20,000 separate genomes of bacteria. So it took them months just to eliminate the ones that they'd already identified from other deep spots on the planet. And, f and the ones that remained were the new ones. All right, well, uh, well she's jumping up and down. You, got, you can't, you, that kind of enthusiasm. Pardon? Well, with a vehicle like this, which is designed to go, to go very deep, uh, anywhere in, in those, those trench systems, the Tonga Trench would be very interesting because the ponded sediment that I was talking about, we think there is a place in the Tonga Trench where some mountains are being pulled in, some, so a chain of seamounts are being pulled in and that uh, one plate going under another. At that point, the, the sediment may be thin to non-existent, in which case it should be possible to look right at two different colors of rock. And that's, that's subduction in action. You're seeing where the rubber meets the road there. That, that would be cool, right? And there, you know, all the other trenches, I mean, any dive one made in any one of those trenches would, would show you new species. For example, one of the things that I was told to look for was, uh, was outcrop, rock outcrop. As I worked my way up the slope, it was so shallow and undulating that I saw sediment outcrops, little slumps, I never got to the, to the native rock that was underlying all the sediment uh, before I bas basically just ran out of time and talent and had to come back. But we had covered our bases. We also took out a lander vehicle that was a, 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 an unpiloted, kind of just a dumb drop vehicle. You just throw it in the water, sinks to the bottom, and it takes pictures and it shoots video and it's got a baited trap and animals can come around and you can capture them. And it actually returned an awful lot of science. So this lander vehicle, we send it down in, in a, 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 a nearby part of the Mariana Trench called the Sirena Deep, which is actually in, in the US, uh, U.S. territory. It drops right in front of a rock outcropping, exactly what I was looking for driving around with the sub. Falls right in front of it, you know, like basically shooting a, a hole in one. And on that rock, rock outcropping, we discovered the deepest uh, bacterial mat. Now, you get bacterial mats around the hydrothermal vents a couple miles down. Nobody's ever seen one seven, almost seven miles down before. So what's it living on? Well, it's living on this process called serpentinization, which is where the water gets, gets squeezed up through the rock by that, by that subduction process. It comes up, it's got, it's got uh, chemicals in it, and those chemicals support bacteria that can metabolize hydrogen and, and methane, right? And sure enough, as the, as the lander landed, stirred up the bottom, and, and uh, the Niskin bottles closed and got a water sample. And in that water sample, the, the uh, scientist at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who was on the expedition with us, planetary uh, scientist, um, was able to, to sieve out a tiny bit of a bacteria sample. And sure enough, it was a methanophilic bac bacteria that was living off of that, that serpentinization reaction. Now, that's a pretty cool discovery. You know why? Because that that chemical energy has been available down there since the planet formed, since the oceans formed. So, f you know, four billion years. So back at the dawn of time, that might well have been the place that life emerged, because you would have had the time for those random organic uh, uh, molecular interactions that ultimately built out a, uh, you know, a, say an RNA molecule or whatever people imagine that first emerging organism to, to look like. So that might have been a window into you know, the, the origin of life on the planet. That's a defensible hypothesis right now. We need to go back to find that rock outcropping or another one like it, take more samples, learn more about it. It's infinite. You know, you're never done. Exploration is never done. Science is never done. That's, to me, that's the cool thing about it. It's job security. <laughs> right?